Legendary, iconic, edgy, loud, controversial, fun, daring, amusing, bold, troublesome, inventive, revolutionary. These are all words used to describe what would become the most influential skateboard company of the 1990s. When Steve Rockle founded World Industries around 1987, he had no idea what he was doing. And people had no idea that within five years, this brand would turn the skateboard industry upside down. Let's examine the origins of World Industries and how Flame Boy, Wet Willy, and Devilman led the wave of the graphic art skateboard industry takeover, birthing brands such as Blind Skateboard, The A Team, and leading an unconventional path that resulted in World Industries becoming the top selling skate company in the world in such a short time. Hey, shout out to Flippin' Boards. Shout out to Flippin' Boards. Flippin' Boards, let's go. Big shout out to my boy, Flippin' Boards. Shout out Flippin' Boards. Flippin' Boards. Flippin' Boards. Shout out Flippin' Boards. Shout out Flippin' Boards, dog. Hey. Yeah. hey shout out Flippin'. Shout out Flippin' Boards, man. <laughs> flippin' Boards. Yes. <laughs> During the skateboard wave of the 1980s, five skateboard companies emerged as the major drivers, Powell Peralta, Santa Cruz, Tracker, Independent, and Vision, which also had Schmidt Sticks and Sims. These companies had almost all the pro talent and a ton of financial backing. It was also at this time that skateboarding would begin to shift from wooden ramps to the streets, and it became increasingly technical from numerous ollie variations and the introduction of heavier flip tricks. Pro skaters were the first to start changing their technology to fit the streets. Skaters who had started life as pros in the early to mid 1980s were no longer teenagers. They had minds of their own and they disliked not being able to follow through on their ideas. The desire of skaters making equipment for skaters set the golden opportunity for the rise of independent skateboard companies. Steve Rocco was the first person to start chipping away at the Big Five's domination of the marketplace. After being dropped by Vision slash Sims, Steve Rocco found himself at rock bottom, no pun intended. He was 27 with no sponsor and thought his life in skateboarding could be over. But the day after being dropped, Steve Rocco was met with an opportunity to buy 500 boards and start his own skate brand. So he cash advanced his credit card for $6,000 and Santa Monica Airlines Rocco Division was born. But how did SMA Rocco Division become World Industries? After an initial team up with John Lucero from Black Label, Steve Rocco decided to spend $800 on shelves for their warehouse. This was enough to scare Lucero off. And once again, Rocco was on the brink of demise. That is, until this unlikely hero showed up, Rodney Mullen. Rodney bought out Lucero for $6,000, intrigued by the idea and the what if factor surrounding Steve Rocco. Steve Rocco claims to have tricked Rodney, but hey, it all worked out in the end, right? So at the time, they were broke. Rocco borrowed $20,000 in a paper bag from a bookie. The payback conditions were simple. Borrow $20,000, pay back $30,000 in one year or else. He claimed that nothing motivates like fear. They say necessity is the mother of invention, and this drew Rocco and Mullen to introduce a royalty pay twice the industry standard. Yep, $2 a board instead of one. This was enough to reel in Jesse Martinez from Vision to SMA Rocco Division. Still not World Industries quite yet, but we're getting there. In 1988, things started moving. SMA Rocco Division had talent and actually began selling more skateboards than anyone had ever anticipated. Rocco actually felt like things were starting to go too well, and his hunch was correct. The eyes of the big skateboard companies were being attracted, and not in the best light. Santa Cruz was licensing the Santa Monica Airlines name, and when Steve Rocco ran an ad saying that wheels came from the same place and were made of the same stuff, basically exposing the so-called special formulas, he was penalized and told he could no longer use the Santa Monica Airlines name. A devastating blow. But wait, there's more. Rodney Mullen was then told if he didn't pull out his investment, which was now up to $18,000, he would be kicked off of the Powell team. Rodney came to Steve and told him he was out. 
Then another competitor kicked in and tried to stop their mold maker from delivering their first double kick molds, an idea that had been brewing up for the new street skating industry. At this point, most people with any common sense would have just given up. These upset companies had combined sales of over $100 million and a whole lot of influence in the market space. The grind was real and Rocco was living literally off dollar bills kids sent in for stickers. He quotes, Fortunately, the only thing I had less of than money was common sense. And by divine timing, trickery, or just sheer will, something incredibly epic and against the grain happened. Rodney Mullen appeared and he announced he would be leaving Powell. Not only that, but he and Mike Vallely were going to ride for World Industries. Mike and Rodney doubled down, each putting in $15,000, which was about the amount needed for the double kick molds. They had changed their name to SMA World Industries as a joke, but since they were told they couldn't use the SMA part, they dropped it, and just World Industries was born. To the skate industry, World was now an actual real company with riders, but the actual company owners ran it like a giant toy. As we entered the 90s, the company model was pretty much, why not? They would do ads without products, skateboard graphics with cartoons instead of skulls, and skateboard shapes that didn't look like skateboards. This might not sound like much by today's standards, but in 1990, this was unheard of. Crazy and even mindless, which is exactly what World Industries wanted to elicit. Rocco even admits, in all honesty, they walk the line closer to insanity than the premeditated genius that people often credited them with. Mike Vallely's Animal Farm Board was an absolute game changer. This board and the people behind it would change the face of skateboarding forever. This was Mark McKee's first skateboard graphic. The cartoon characters not only represented a clear departure from the usual skulls and gore which dominated the market at the time, but they introduced the element of wit and humor into graphics as well. In the years to follow, McKee would set the standard in graphics for the whole industry. This was also Rodney Mullen's debut as a shape maker. He designed this board and started the evolution of today's popsicle shape. This was the first professionally endorsed symmetrical double kick deck. At that time, almost all large boards were pointy-nosed. They looked more like a giant freestyle board than anything else. Though by today's standards, it may look funny, this board was the predecessor of the modern shapes to come. And like McKee, Rodney Mullen would lead the way in shapes for the next decade. The ability to bring his own ideas to life may have been the reason Rodney doubled down on World Industries instead of bowing down to Powell at the crossroads. And not gonna lie, this board is still a GOAT in the game. It continues to be highly sought after with reissues that get gobbled down by collectors and skaters alike. The Ripple Effect in 1990, an inspired Mark Gonzalez approached Rocco. He was writing for Vision at the time, but he had an idea of starting his own company, Blind. A play on Blind being the opposite of Vision. They started the company together and took their best pro from World, who at the time was Jason Lee, and moved him to Blind. Things continued to take off from there, with 101 skateboards also starting, featuring the legendary Nada's Coppus. Rocco said it was a real simple handshake deal, nothing was ever really planned out, and it was cool. Now this next company that launched was a bit more complicated. Plan B was different. In 1992, Mike Ternaski left H Street due to some disagreements. Mike T was a talented individual with uncanny foresight. One key thing Mike was able to accomplish was that he got Rodney Mullen, the world's best freestyle, pointed in the street skating direction. He recognized Rodney's talents and as a result, most of the ollie variations done by today's skaters have their roots with Rodney Mullen. Rocco became the distributor and manufacturer and Mike worked on marketing out of his San Diego office. Mike was going to call the company Type A after the personality classification, but eventually decided to call it Plan B. Plan B seemed like an easy call, formulated for instant success. That is, until a disagreement ensued between Plan B writer Rick Howard and Mike T in 1993. 
This resulted in Rick Howard and seven top pros leaving Plan B to start Girl. Yes, seven pros left Plan B to start the iconic, epic, killing it to this day, Girl Skateboards. And that wasn't it. In January 1994, Girl started up chocolate skateboards, resulting in even more Plan B riders departing. And although there was so much turmoil going on between companies, Mike T made Steve Rocco promise that they would beat them in business fair and square. Tragically, Mike T was killed in a car accident in 1994. Where do you go from here? World Industries founder Steve Rocco was at a crossroads. Rocco would need to think outside of the box if he wanted to bounce back and keep his company afloat amidst all the recent events. Plan B eventually broke away from the World Industries family, and in 1995, something epic was about to happen. There was a need for a more cohesiveness amongst the World Industries and blind brands. They needed directions. And like a sign from above, Rocco saw Mark McKee's doodle of Devil Man and made a huge business directional decision. He wanted to reinvent the World Industries brand, starting with the Devil Man logo as the base of World Industries. Cartoon characters that could be marketed at the up and coming skateboard generation. Kids ages 8 through 12. And as if Rocco and Mullen weren't already characters enough, in 1996, they officially introduced these iconic characters to the brand, Flame Boy and Wet Willy. Some would say Devil Man, Flame Boy, and Wet Willy are illustrated versions of the World Industries founders. Their arrival was met with impeccable timing as the introduction of the X Games sparked a record-breaking wave of young skateboarders. Worldwide infamous cartoon illustrations started showing up on many of these skaters' first boards. And even though World Industries had some of the biggest names in skateboarding, like Kareem Campbell and Daewon Song, the logo boards were still selling at a much higher rate. People were going crazy over Flame Boy, Wet Willy, and Devil Man. The demand was so high that they were able to raise the price of the logo boards to the same price of their pro boards without needing to pay out any royalties to the riders. So at this time, needless to say, World Industries was booming. I truly found this a brilliant move for multiple reasons. Number one, the mass appeal. It's like choosing your favorite cereal at a grocery store. Number two, the illustrated battle of the cartoon characters. Are you team Wet Willy or are you team Flame Boy? These character graphics also created a form of protection against any pros leaving the company. As we previously mentioned, if a skater were to leave, Wet Willie and Flame Boy were still here to stay. On top of not needing to pay out any deck royalties on these decks. Sheesh. This business model would then be replicated with the introduction of the Grim Reaper of Blind Skateboards. And it worked again. The A-Team was also created, an elite caliber of skate skill and ability, but we'll get into that epic tale in another video. Additional game-changing innovations made at World Industries included making it possible for all of their riders to get health insurance, and that was unheard of at the time. Nobody else was doing it. Steve Rocco revolutionized the industry standard of royalties too, giving riders $2 per board if their name was on the board. Normal industry standards were $1 per board. Another big change was leveraging credit as opposed to cash on delivery or cash up front, which was the conventional procedure. Leveraging credit gave World Industries a huge competitive advantage. In a very short period of time, they were able to extend that credit to a lot of shops and companies who had never had credit before. It definitely hurt the competitors though. It shocked them too much because their small companies couldn't afford it and they didn't know what to do. World was always one step ahead of the game. Not to mention the first skateboard company to give employees stock options before finally deciding to sell the company in early 1998. They truly made the most of their competitive advantages. 
Over the next couple years, world industry surged. Literally, Flame Boy, Wet Willy, and Devil Man were all over the skate industry and all over the young skateboarders' skateboards. So what would lead Steve Rocco and Rodney Mullen to actually sell World Industries? Well, in 1998, World was the number one skate brand in the world, no pun intended, and Blind was number two. There were three big factors which led to the ultimate decision of selling the company for a historic amount. 1. The overall economy and stock market were at a historic high, which asked if the bubble will eventually burst. 2. The skateboard industry cycle. Rocco and Mullen knew that every 10 years, the skateboard industry market would peak. And so that allowed them to make this educated decision and have foresight and basically sell World Industries at a high point in the skateboard market. Lastly is how they were managing the company. And to be honest, Rocco claims they were hitting home runs like three out of four times. And you truly can't expect to continue hitting home runs like that forever. Matter of fact, the way they had run the business was so uncanny, they almost felt compelled to sell. I mean, look, Rocco stated that if they weren't sure what to do about something, they'd literally toss a coin and decide who has to put out the fire and handle the issue. Legend has it that World Industries was getting sued by the Hell's Angels because of a board of the Devil Man with Hell's Angels imagery on it. So the World Industries team flipped coins to see who had to go to the meeting and resolve it. They would also bet on a lot of things, literally miniature golf and even speed chess. They were really just having fun with all aspects of life. And hey, they're crushing it at the time, so what can you do but tip your hats off to them? But they were also aware of the market and how directly connected their success would correlate with economical changes. Essentially, if the economy goes down, they're screwed. If the economy is okay, but the skateboard industry cycle goes down, they'd be screwed. If they stopped hitting three out of four business home runs and start messing up, they'd be screwed. So they collectively decided to market the company up for sale. And surprisingly, as hard as they've been crushing it, and although they had marketed the company for sale to investment bankers, private equity firms, and hundreds of prospective buyers, they only received one offer. That one offer was for a ton of money. $29 million to be exact. And for 70% of the world industry's company. So after all the negotiations, loans, contracts, earnouts, and employment contracts, Steve Rocco and Rodney Mullen ended up with millions in their bank accounts by October of 1998. A perfect execution of buy low, sell high, with a ton of history made in between. There's an epic tale of the infamous Steve Rocco having his Land Rover trapped after hours in a parking lot and somehow not being able to pay to be let out. The sign wouldn't go up. So after a while, he goes, F it, who cares, we're millionaires, and then drives right through the wooden stop sign to enjoy the rest of his night. And that's what World Industries did. They came in, saw the stop sign, and decided, you know what, we're going right through. Former World Industries team riders include Rodney Mullen, Mike Villele, Jeremy Klein, Randy Colvin, Chico Breens, Daywon Song, Kareem Campbell, Chad Fernandez, Mike Crum, and other legends. Oh yeah, and after that whopping $29 million sale, World Industries became the first skate brand to be publicly traded on the stock market. So what happened after selling World Industries? Under the new ownership of Dwindle Distribution, the world brand saw an addition of many product categories. No longer just a skateboard brand, World Industries launched into larger apparel offering, footwear, and multiple licensed products like snow, water, sports, and toys. Today, World Industry has a mission to offer skate lifestyle products while keeping in touch with its heritage of being a youth-centered, authentic brand in the skate industry. You can find multiple products from World at local skate shops, family footwear stores, and beyond. Most recently, they have brought back some iconic reissues of Flame Boy, Wet Willy, and Devil Man graphics while introducing new graphics as well. Many will say the new decks don't have the same appeal as the classics, but many skaters and collectors are also just stoked to relive nostalgia with these reissues. 
So what are your thoughts on the new revamp of World Industries? And do you have a childhood favorite classic World Industries graphic? I've got a few. Thanks for watching. And if you're looking to build your skate deck collection, check out my online store for World Industries skateboards and a ton of rare and cool decks. Subscribe to my channel for more skateboard loving content. Flipping boards, flipping out.